Uh, we're ready to go. It's another Thursday, and we're back here for Thinking Link. I know, shock and awe. Good, sizable crowd. If you haven't been here before, well, you should come back. As it's like this every single time, almost, close. Actually, it's a little bit bigger because of you. Anyway, um, uh, we are uh, here in the RSP building uh, where Capsule has our new home. RSP is a wonderful architectural firm here and nationally. They turned this brewery into um, brewers, from brewers of beer to brewers of ideas in this beautiful space. You can thank them for that. It's the only castle to beer that I know, or castle to ideas now, I guess. And, um, and we are very, very happy to be guests in this building. Uh, we are Capsule. We are a special projects agency, and we put on this event once a month to share ideas and provide inspiration in our community. Uh, we do a lot of work with Patagonia, Arcteryx, uh, Sitka, a variety of brands, even Cureleaf, which you probably don't know, but because the laws around cannabis are changing, you're going to know Cureleaf soon. Look it up. And the only thing we ask of you is you do a review of us. And you'll see a QR code around here somewhere. Just put up a review on Google, you know, like a nice five star. Yes, I'm biasing the research. A five star would be good. What you enjoyed. Anyway, um, and we have three amazing guests that are going to share a wonderful story of something coming to life here in the Twin Cities. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves, starting with Gavin, if that's okay. And he's going to share his title relative to this little venture they're in. <laughs> Is this on? Now it's on. Yikes. <laughs> Carl, this one's, you can have my mic later. Uh, my name is Gavin Kaysen. It's an echo. It is. Uh, for me too. Uh, I own Soigne Hospitality, which is Spoon and Stable, Demi, Mara, Soka Cafe, and now part of Cook Spell Corp. My title is I'm Superman. That's my title. So the reason I'm Superman is, and I still actually genuinely believe I can fly, like with all of my heart and soul. And so when I was a kid, I tried to fly twice, not once, twice off of my staircases in my house, and I cracked my head open. And a week later, I did it again, and I cracked the same spot. So, I mean, the consistency of where I flew was there. Um, and so I always tell them, I'm like, I think, I think I can fly. I think I can do it. So now they title me as Superman. So I, I need a cape. I can see. I can see. <laughs> she just starts laughing. It's okay. Don't worry. Everybody heard it. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. We're happy to tell our little story, which is going to be a big story as we keep growing. Take it away. Hi, I'm Marie Dwyer. And my official title is I'm the boss. I, I am the girl that the boys report to. So um, that's my, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thought you'd like that. I'm Carl. Uh, my title is the guy who gets shit done. <laughs> and also report to Marie. <laughs> okay, so I'm supposed to, my first question is to you, Marie. Why are we supposed to refer to you as Sean Hayes? Oh, God. I, okay, so. I don't even know the answer. I have no idea. Do you know who Sean Hayes is? I do. Yeah. I looked him up. I had to look him up. So when Aaron asked us if we'd be interested in doing this presentation today, I just went to, I flipped to the Smartless podcast, which one of my colleagues recommended that we listen to. You guys listen to Smartless? Okay, lots of people, lots of fans. So I uh, immediately thought, what is my role going to be on this stage when I'm flanked by Gavin Kaysen and Carl Benson? They can talk like nobody's business. And um, it made me think that if we had to pick titles and we were the Smartless podcast, Gavin would be. Do you listen to it? No. Oh, okay. This is going to be. Like listen to other people talk. Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin would be Will Arnett because he has a lot to say and lots of people like to hear what Will has to say and Gavin. 
And um, Carl, Carl would be Justin Bateman. You, you would be Justin Bateman. And um, I would be Sean Hayes, stuck in the middle. You know, kind of taking a little bit of a back seat, but I have stuff that's going through my mind and it might come out artistic and sideways all at the same time. So there you Carl, go. Carl, are you offended by that? We didn't give Carl a mic for a reason. <laughs> It's actually really true. So one time we were, we were in, we were, sorry, Carl, but this is coming out to the world. They need to know about this. We were, we had, we had a, we were having a conference, a Zoom call, whatever they're called. And um, I don't, I don't remember who was all on the call. You were definitely on the call. We were all there. We're talking about the importance of what we're doing, the brand, the, the new space, et cetera. And Carl just like kept talking. So I was like, can you just fucking mute him? And so then they muted him and he just kept going and talking the whole time. And he's talking the whole time, but you can't hear anything he's saying. And so the meeting was, I mean, we got it done in 10 minutes. It was quick. They didn't even tell me the meeting was over. I stayed there for 40 minutes. So we get up here, there's only three microphones. I got a lot done by myself, which was good. <laughs> Typical. Oh, that's great. I, uh, we got to give a little bit back to Carl, because if you watch the way Cooks has been run in this new venture, uh, we lived in our office right around the corner, and there'd be moments I'd come over to see, you know, what's going on over there, and he would be putting chairs in the back of a truck, he would be, I mean, hauling stuff different places, truly an entrepreneur, so I don't want to, you know, we don't want to give him too many dings too early, no. right, it's really impressive, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, Gavin, do you want to share, <laughs> do you want to share how this little adventure started? So uh, I had a restaurant in YZ called Belcor, uh, which may, you may or may not remember, uh, but it was, a great, it was a great space and I loved having the restaurant, um, but it started before that. So when they, when they moved across the street from where Spoon and Stable is, oh, they're gonna give you a mic, they feel bad. Oh, I, wow. I get the Dang long it. mic. Okay, so um, when they moved in next or across the street, I came over, uh, with a like a bowl of arancini, we serve arancini at Spoon and Stable. So it's a little fried risotto, like rice rice ball, but you can charge more when you use the Italian word and not a fried rice ball. So um, I brought over a bowl. We sat down and we were eating arancini. We were just kind of talking about Cooks of Crocus Hill and what they were going to do. And then we were talking about Spoon and Stable, and it just formed this friendship and really this bond. And then what ended up happening? Fast forward many years when Belcourt closed in Wyzetta. Uh, we had, of course, all of the equipment inside of the kitchen, and we had the team, and we could disperse them only so far and to so many different spots. And then it was just kind of a text between us of saying, hey, what if we just kind of do a little pop-up and see what happens and see if, see if we can open this here. And a pop-up has led to a lot more adventure and excitement and lessons and staff and everything in between. Um, but it goes to show that creating anything can come out of vulnerability, but more than more importantly, you know, you have to sort of figure out a way to reinvent yourself always and not think like, okay, I got this one thing figured out and we're going to go. So once we decided to do the pop-up, I mean, the first, I remember the first day, cause I showed up to the first day to go get something and I, I will never forget it because my now middle son, who was probably eight at the time, we're standing in line. He like, he looks up to me. He's like, why are we standing in line? Don't you own this? And I was like, just be quiet. Stand in line. <laughs> Don't look at anybody. Just take take the line. But it was a long line. It was awesome. Uh, Marie, you have a design background that most people don't maybe know that. You have a very, very significant, notable design background. How did that contribute to this little adventure? Well, I think, um, first of all, we brought two brands together that are very aligned. So we, we chose our partnership um, based on our significant history in the industry and um, it, of retail and in this environment in the community. And uh, Gavin certainly had also a significant brand as well. So when we brought the two brands together, that was kind of the first, um, when you think about it creatively, that was the first thing that we considered. Um, and now as we go on to furthering, we've changed our name, we've, we've, brought, we've married those brands together. Um, 
everything. We look at everything. We look at the history of both brands. We looked at the fonts. I mean, if you want to talk specific design stuff, uh, so that when people actually look at the logo that we've created, the Cook Spell Core logo, which has three variations, by the way, when you look at it, it feels familiar. And it feels familiar from the Bellcor side as well as from the Cooks of Crocus Hill side. So that was first. We didn't want to alienate. We didn't want to have to start over. So it really feels um, like we've merged it together. Um, and the same with the interiors. So those things are all considered as well. So we're looking at history and um, all yeah. significant pieces. I was really talking about how you arrange the hotel rooms whenever you go places. I think Olivia said that at one point in time, right? What? Yeah. You arrange the hotel rooms? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I do have a bit of a, no, it's when we, not a hotel room. When it's we do, the BRBO. BRBO. The yeah. BRBO. Uh, yeah. Okay. Like when yeah, we yeah. go skiing. It's I, an indication of a I'm designer. unloading the car and then I come up into the living room and Marie's got all the kids rearranging the furniture yeah, I can't, in there. So the, it feels if, better if for if the this, five days yeah. that we're going to be in that spot. If the sofa is in the wrong place, it's in the wrong place. So we, <laughs> it's, we got to get it where it belongs. And so that, yeah, that is a thing. Yeah. And so nobody's in the wrong place. It's in the wrong place. It, never, they never moved. Like one of the ladies sent me a note and she said, you moved all the furniture. I said, shoot, I forgot to put it back. She said, no, I like it better this way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been known to do that when we travel with for business too. Um, so my, my team is over there and they're all nodding because I did it. We were in Atlanta recently and I had to just, I had to address the living room. Yeah, you, it was all good. Okay. Marie's wondering why she brought that up in front of me before. Anyway, <laughs> that wasn't on the list of questions, was it? Approved questions. Uh, Carl, back to the serious side of things. Why do I have to be serious? <laughs> because we know it's impossible for you to be serious. Good. Okay, so that North Loop location, what did you see when it, after it opened and the traction and all things that started to grow around that? You shared a lot with me early on of like, the numbers were amazing. Well, I think it was, you know, we did the pop-up during the, the uh, sort of start of the pandemic. I think there was a spot in there where Bachelor Farmer had announced they were closing and Moose and Sadie's was closing. And uh, the, there's a Dunn Brothers over on Washington that was closing. And I kept looking at our, so our business before that location was, um, so our business traditionally was cooking schools and corporate events and retail. And when the pandemic hit and we were shut down, there was, you know, Grand Avenue is motivated because we've been there 50 years. So the retail sort of momentum that happens there is significant. And in North Loop, it was the opposite. It was cooking classes and corporate events. And we were just dead closed. You know, the governor shut down the state on May 20th. And um, I kept thinking, there was a way for us to reopen in St. Paul, but I just couldn't figure out what to do in North Loop because the metrics were just completely flipped. We tried to do grab and go before the start of the pandemic and we had the counters and we had the space in there. And when all those guys announced they were closing, I, so when I texted Gavin and I was like, you know, you're reopening Belcor out in YZ. Do you want to do this pop-up and just do the bakery? And if we can have some motivation, we can use the space, the bakery can, you know, we have social distancing, it's a consumable, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, the corporate event piece or the cooking class piece. And um, so after we opened it, as uh, Gavin said, the, it was spectacular. And our, I think I was the first day I drove the van out to YZ at 530 from St. Paul, the Cook's van, and filled it up. And then I drove that van every morning for three months because who was going to drive the van at 530 in the morning? I kept thinking I was the Dunkin' Donuts guy. Got to make the donuts. <laughs> See what I'm saying? He was driving the van. Yeah. Yeah. The it's big got to get shit done. And, you know, yeah, somebody's got to get shit, shit flows done. downhill. I'm the lowest man on the Cook's totem pole. So, or the only man on the Cook's totem pole. Better still. <laughs> <laughs> also, the only one on mute. But yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> She'll regret giving me the microphone. I'll turn it off. You can watch. <laughs> uh, okay. So, Gavin, how does this fit, this new venture, fit into the overall portfolio um, and this partnership that you're doing into the other experiences you have? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, very often the way that <clears throat> I think about growth and for, for our company, 
you know, people just think it should be very traditional, right? And when you have a restaurant and a restaurant group, it's, it's all kind of sort of the same. What often isn't really understood is that restaurants and restaurant groups, usually every deal is pretty different for the chef or for the owner, if the chef is the owner. Some of it's licensing deals, some of it's management deals, some of it's debt deals, um, some of it's none of it. Some of it is, you know, they give you $50 million, they build out the space and they use your name and you walk away with a fee. Um, there's all sorts of different ways for it to happen. And I think that the person that I worked, so I worked for Danielle Balud in New York City. And when I worked for Danielle, he had four restaurants. When I started with his company and when I left, he had 18. I was with him yesterday in New York. He's opening eight more spaces this year. And he just opened four in the last four months. So he's gonna open 12 spaces in 12 months. And it seems crazy. Like I see everybody shaking their head like, wow, he's batshit crazy. I mean, he is, I love Danielle with all my heart, but he is crazy. Um, but, but it's because everything is like a little bit different, right? And, and maybe we were even just slightly ahead of him on this because we created our brands together, I guess now three years ago, and he just partnered with Tiffany. And so he has a restaurant inside of the new Tiffany store in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue. And it's called Tiffany Blue Box, Breakfast at Tiffany's, blah, 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 right? So they open to the public Monday. They have 400 reservations on the books. They have 1,200 people on the wait list. And 1,200 people on the wait list for like the next three months, every single day. Damn. And if it, if it told me anything listening to that, it's just like this intention of going out to buy something that is of retail and to actually show up and receive an experience, which is what we now give, is genuinely what people want. And so when I was touring all of his spaces yesterday and seeing this all throughout Manhattan, he's got a couple more lined up that are not public yet. But when I was touring around and like seeing all these different spaces, it made me really proud to know that ours started over just like, hey, let's give this a shot and see what happens. And we recognize that people really, really enjoy what that experience looks like. So. Um, it all fits because it's hospitality, right? And so, you know, we have another company called KZ Pro where we cook for professional athletes. We only cook for the, the Wild, the Timberwolves, and the Lynx. We're behind the scenes. We only cook for the athletes. We don't cook for anybody else. But the, re the reason that that world works and not a lot of people know I have it is like it's hospitality. It's the same thing we do here. I mean, I've walked in the store countless of times to like check in on the team and grab a soup or croissant and Somebody will stop me and be like, oh, chef, which, which salad bowl should I get? And I'm like, I don't know. Just buy all of them. They're like, okay. And they buy all of them. And it's like, why not? You need them for everything, right? But it's, 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 it's so intentional to, for, for what I do, it's so intentional to find ways that I can spread my wings and give that, that hospitality away and, and share with guests what it is that I love more than anything, which is to take care of people. And what I've learned through them is the power is the power of being able to do it in such a different way. Retail is not different from hospitality at all. We just look at it differently because of how we are. It looks very transactional, uh, but they have figured out a way to not make it that way. And then to have the bakery part of it, now it just doesn't feel like it exists. It feels like you walk in for a hug and you walk out with a bag. Wow. So that's good. if I heard correctly, Danielle got a, tip, a blue Tiffany's box and you got Audrey Hepburn. Wow, look at that. That's what I'm saying. That was sweet. Huh? Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> I said he got the blue Tiffany's box. So can somebody Gavin tweet that? Audrey Hepburn. That's you. Oh, right, right, right. right. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, well, it, it, it would seem to make sense that we back up a little bit and do the, the history of cooks. Um, because some people might think you started hook, cooks, but you know you didn't. But you are way back in the origin story. So, Carl, do you want sharing that? Uh, absolutely. Um, my connection to cooks. I was having dinner at my, well when I first, probably four years after I moved to Minnesota. I lived in Highland, and our next door neighbor, um, Russ Nelson's his name, real estate guy here in the Twin Cities. Are you ready? This is where Marie's going to turn off on, my Marie mic. Marie just me goes, this is going to be a long one. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Everyone buckle up. Or, the origin story. Yes, no well, questions. There was Adam and there was Eve, and they all got together. And then, um, and so I met uh, Martha Kemmer, who was the founder of Cooks. And um, Martha and I told, I was transitioning in my employment. Um, and... <laughs> I have to be careful now this day. Um, and a friend of 
Russ has suggested that I talk to Martha. And I was like, I don't know shit about cooking schools. I know not the my only retail experience was working at Tom McCann shoes in high school. And David just kept on me and on me. Well, you like to cook and you're into food and you run a business and Martha would be great. And he was on me all the whole dinner. And I agreed to have coffee with Martha. That was on a Sunday. I had coffee with Martha on Wednesday. I was supposed to meet with her for 45 minutes and I met with her for three and a half hours. And it was like, Martha's Danish, her family's immigrants, or she's like the granddaughter of immigrants. My parents are immigrants. And um, I, I heard from her on Thursday. She said, I'd like you to take over and run Cooks. And I said, okay. And I quit my part, the other partnership I had on Friday. So it was five days. And then that was 25 years ago. And Martha had already, she started as thrice. She became Cooks of Crocus Hill in 80, 1985. And then I took over in 1994. And um, Marie was working there at that point in time. And um, the very first time I met her, she quit. <laughs> and I said, you can't quit because someday I'm gonna marry you. I didn't, I thought it, I thought it, but no, I'm just joking. She quit anyway. So did you acquire cooks for her or what? No, sure. Does that, that, yes. That's funny. what it sounded like right there. Yeah. I never yeah. heard that part of the story. Time to mute. She just told me time to mute. <laughs> Mic off. Okay, Marie, back to you. And being the calm in the middle of these two and the chaos. Yeah. Uh, tell me how you do that. How do I do it? How do you remain calm in their chaos? Um, well... <laughs> Um, um, well, they have a lot of ideas. There's an absolute ton of ideas that come out of these guys all the time. It's like a fire hydrant, constant fire hydrant. And uh, one of my other titles is the filter. Um, I've been called that I am the filter. Um, but with these guys, I kind of just let it rip. I let them just go and spin and do their thing. And in the end, um, I'm the boss. So that's how I, that's my strength right there. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll say that Gavin and I, I forget when we said something, it wasn't terribly long ago. And Marie said, okay, you knuckleheads, you cannot come up Not with say another. Knuckleheads, no. no, what did you say? Okay, boys, you guys can't come up with any more ideas. And we were like, we, we have, you, give us at least a timeline. She didn't, she didn't want us to talk to each other about ideas until June 1st. June 1st, that was what it was. January, June January 1st. 1st. And that was, we she had said to that to us six months ago. Yep. We, we had to get through Q4, and uh, you guys, I think, are aware we're opening another location, and I just said, can we just, like, get this thing going? Let's get it going, and then you can talk. But what she didn't say was, June 1st, we are not allowed to bring a whole plan for what happens for so the Carl and I years. have developed all these plans, so June 1st, she's going to receive all these plans that we have decided. <laughs> this is the two weeks before the storm. <laughs> they know. <laughs> they know it's coming. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I don't know how you do it. I really don't. It's. I thought it was bad enough with Carl, but yeah. He just. It's another level. It's all another level. Uh, okay. So we were Carl getting muted. Um, we were. Oh, we were going to talk about the personas. We worked on some personas together. Can you go into those? Yeah. Those are really fun. So we did some uh, preliminary work with Aaron and his team in um, when we knew that we were gonna take this concept further. And so we started to really look at who's our customer, the Cook's customer, um, and who was the customer, how had that changed since we had the pop-up? And what we, I'll start with the first persona is Elizabeth. So Elizabeth we identified is, um, she's a mom, she's an entertainer, she has a disposable income. She's between the ages of 42 and 60. And she likes the nicer things in life. She probably eats at Spoon and Stable, um, probably ate at Belcour. Uh, and she has raised a family. A lot of the kids are out of the house or soon to be out of the house. And then, and she's pretty, that's a pretty solid demographic for us. We've looked at that for years and years at Cook's. 
But then what we started to notice um, as Belcour was our pop-up and we really started to dig into what's going on on social, what's going on, who's coming through the front door, who are all these people, what are they responding to? What we decide, what we discovered was that um, Liz started to come in more frequently. Liz is between the ages of 24 and 40. She likes to uh, be entertained. She seeks entertainment. Um, she's, if she's not cooking, she's starting to become very interested in food and cooking. And Elizabeth might've been her mom. So she was exposed to a lot of um, entertaining, good food. She watched her mom learn how to cook. Her mom probably took some classes at Cooks at Crocus Hill. Um, and now she's coming through the door because of pastries. Uh, when you look at Instagram, they, that demographic loves pretty pictures and like really good pictures of pastry and other food things, but really good pictures of pastry that gets everybody going. And um, so we started to see more and more of that age group of the Liz's coming through the front door. And then they were, they will show up with Elizabeth. So it's been a really fun um, uh, extension um, and to introduce this other demographic to everything that we do and cooking classes. So now they're taking date night classes, they're bringing all their pals, and um, it's given us a lot of meat to kind of look at and consider when we look at all of our channels. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> well, before we hand the microphone over to our audience because there's going to be a lot of questions i want to ask each of you what this new venture is going to look like because as we were working through things the energy that was palpable as far as what was being developed and what was being you know what was coming to life <clears throat> i'd love to hear from each of you what you see is the future of this venture where is it going how big is it going to be how many locations how amazing all those types of things whatever Alrighty, let's go how and we're going to see the audience is going to judge how consistent it is between all three of you should I start? Name. Totally. I'll start. It's not June 1st. Um, yeah, it's close enough. Well, I think, I mean, to take a step back, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that a brand like Cooks of Crocus Hill that is 50 years old and a young brand like Belcour and Belcour Bakery, which is spoons nine, so that's six, have come together. I mean, I will say that like throughout the process of the last year, or more, the three of us have had a ton of conversation around what this would look like. And I mean, admittedly, it's like, it's difficult. Like, you know, I mean, Cooks of Crocus Hill is a very powerful brand on its own and Belcour and Belcour Bakery have its own and people have their opinions about wishing where, where Belcour would be as if it's like a, a pawn, you know, and you could just put it anywhere, or bring it back to YZ or whatever. And so it was really, it, it was, it was certainly hard to have those conversations of like, okay, if we merge these two, if we put the two brands and just merge them together like that, and it's one logo and it's one unified voice, what does that mean? And I mean, honestly, like, I'm really proud of all of us and our teams for being able to jump on that and say like, yeah, we believe in it. I mean, we, yes, it's one thing to watch the guests come through every day and get the baked products or grab coffee or sign up for a class or, or, or buy some of the retail, or whatever it might be. Um, but ultimately they're buying into what it is that we sat down to say, how do we sort of recreate this and have it look and be different? I mean, I genuinely think it's really unique. I, I often believe, I very strongly believe that whenever you build anything in my world, it's restaurants. So I always look to this landscape of what we have around us and say, what do we have and what do we not have? I didn't think Spoon and Stable, like a Spoon and Stable existed in Minneapolis when I opened it, which is why I opened it. I don't think it, I didn't think a Demi existed, which is why I opened it and so on. And I don't think anything like this out there exists the way it is. And so, I mean, I have a dream of building many of them and going all over with it and having a lot of fun and seeing what that looks like. And so hopefully we can get to that point. Hopefully we can see what that, what that means. Um, but we're going to learn a lot. I mean, the newest store that we have opening in Edina is going to teach us a lot because it's our first one that we came together on collectively as a group and said, okay, what do we want this to look like? Because North Loop, we just sort of put it in there. St. Paul, we just put it in there. Edina, we took a seat, we know we took a step back and we said, how do we want to design it? What does the space look like? What does the experience look like? What does that feel like? 
And it's really cool to be over there and to like talk to the other uh, folks who have shops. And they're like, we're so happy that you guys are here. We know this is going to help drive traffic. We know there's going to be, you know, a lot of people and a lot of excitement and we hope that's true. And so then that way we can take that model and, and see how do we, how do we um, grow from it and become stronger and better. That's great. Going to follow that up, Marie. <clears throat> Where do you think it's going to be? Well, if I, um, I am excited about the possibility of doing more with this brand. I, I think that when you look at what St. Paul is, and you look at what North Loop is, and you look at what we've created in Edina, the Edina model is the articulation that, I, that we've all been really excited about to move toward. Um, it's bringing all of the things together. You can take cooking classes, you can eat pastry, you can sit out on the street, you can shop for retail product, and it's all in under 3,000 square feet, which is a huge accomplishment to put that many things in that small of a space. And um, like Gavin said, I think we're, we're really, really excited to see what this one brings, and that would be potentially the model that we would move forward with. Um, as you guys are probably aware, retail has taken a real hit over the last 15 years. Um, but what we're discovering is that with our new model, that retail has new life. So, and with food and cooking and this synergy that's come together. Uh, so I think it's pretty exciting and we'll see what happens in the future. And I think that um, sort of embellishing on the retail thing that our experience for 25 years is, I mean, I liken it to being a shark when you say, if you're not moving, you're dying. And, you know, we have uh, survived the sort of turnaround on Grand Avenue. We survived the retail apocalypse. We survived e-commerce. We survived pandemic. We survived riots. We survived when aliens invade, we're going to be like, we'll be golden. We'll figure out how to get through that. And I think now when we read in trade magazines that the retailers that are still in existence are looking to find ways to deliver an ex a retail experience. And when, when I read about that, I'm always like, well, how authentic or how legitimate is that experience? And in our case, because we have the cooking classes and we like to cook and, you know, cooking is different than buying a pair of running shoes. It's like your success only comes after you sit around the dinner table with your kids. And it's that you have dinner, you have a Sunday supper, you drink too much wine or you throw rolls at each other at the dinner table. That's where the sort of culinary relationship gets secured. And in this case here, then it's like when we add the bakery to it, the, the experience is no longer, or the, the engagement is no longer experiential, it's immersive. So when I think about what's coming next, it's for the three of us to really build on this to how, how can we be out ahead of that curve that it's not just an experience that somebody says, try this, do this, do that. It's like, it's completely authentic with Gavin and Marie and I in, in the context of our work experience, but also our family experience and our Saturday experiences and our Thursday night experiences. And that's pretty powerful for me. And then, <clears throat> go ahead. <clears throat> so you're not throwing really expensive croissants at each other at the dinner table. These are like rolls, right? They're pre-bought. Yeah. Pre-bought. Yeah, Costco, yeah. Costco rolls. Frozen. Frozen rolls. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> okay, so we're going to turn it over to our audience for questions. And we've already got a question. And do I have a microphone out there maybe? Or am I? Hi, thank you. Ooh, that's loud, that's loud. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you talked a lot about experiences throughout the day. And I think that's very important. Um, and you mentioned, Carl, you talked about authentic and immersive. So I just wanted to know, is there a consistent or a favorite ingredient, I'm using puns liberally here, to make up that secret sauce for curating your unique, valuable, differentiating, really authentic and immersive experiences to keep you top of mind and relevant? And was that for Carl? Everybody. Ooh, it's a tough one. I think for me, the 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 authenticity is, I mean, you used it in the description, but you know, our, I was looking at our team over here. When, when we travel, our, our very first thing that we do is if we're going to Chicago, say, is where's the cooking store in Chicago? Then it's where's 
the well now increasingly it's where's the bakery store we took our family to to see my family in sweden and we saw the kids on saturday at graduation and they said do you realize we went to 14 bakeries in sweden and i was like well we wanted to make sure that the best uh, canel buller is here in north loop or in edina and we verified that but so we're constantly it's our curiosity it's authentic to who marie and i particularly are as people just that exploration sure i think for um <clears throat> for me like i said earlier it's it's about hospitality you know so as i think about uh how to connect people with with food um I just always have found like once you put food on a table, everything sort of neutralizes and like who's ever, whomever they are, like once you're around that dinner table together and you're having a meal, it just sort of neutralizes everything. And I think it's really powerful to be able to um, create that in our, in our stores, but then just to be able to give, give the guests a hospitality experience that they somewhat, somewhat didn't expect. I, mean, I talk about it a lot with restaurants, but we call it the majestic moments of hospitality. And so like, at Spoon and Stable, as an example, you get cotton candy if it's your birthday or anniversary, or if you like, if you're like my mother and you come in and you say it's your birthday every time, they're still going to give it to you. <clears throat> um, like they they figured her out, you know. But the whole reason of why we created that was I was at a Vikings game, I don't know, nine ten years ago, and I watched these four like middle aged guys who had too much to drink get four things of cotton candy, and they were like so giddy and excited, and I thought to myself like, it's so joyful to watch how joyful they are over something so simple and so that's why we created cotton candy was just to sort of like drop this pretension and i often think that french bakeries in particular carry that a little bit that pretentious notion anything that is french you, you tend to think expensive and pretentious and white tablecloth and all of these things but then you go into the store and it doesn't feel like that you know, it feels very welcoming. And, and, and then you sort of look around and you say, you see things that you might need for your, for your own kitchen. And then you see our bakers rolling out the croissants and making all the vinoiserie and using the sheeter and then making the chocolate mousse and the team packaging the cookies and, you know, all of the, and when you see all of that happen, um, you know, as a guest, you tend to take ownership of it and it makes it feel very, very authentic because everything's there. There's nothing behind a closed door. Well, I also think to elaborate a little bit, that was by design as well. So we really set out to um, bring the bakers up from the basement or out from the back room. We put them in the front windows. We wanted that whole experience to be an inside outside shared experience so that you actually get to see uh, the bakers laminating. How many people get to have that experience? Like you actually get to see them rolling and cutting and doing all the things with that laminated dough. And families come in, they bring their kids in and they go and they talk to the bakers. So when we first started this whole thing, because bakers aren't usually on display like that, we had to actually train them how to interact and, and raise the bar on their level of hospitality, but it's super fun and they do such a good job. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say about hospitality in retail, the level of hospitality that Gavin's team brought in when we did the pop-up and trained our team to was amazing. And in retail, if you think about your retail experiences, particularly now, when you go into a store, you don't have the real warm, fuzzy feelings. People aren't, you know, kind of glomming all over you to help you. And that is the experience that you get because we're, we're borrowing um, from that level of hospitality and we're layering it into retail. So that's, that's another piece that's been really successful. Love that. That is great. Uh, other questions? Yes, right in the front row. I loved what uh, Gavin, you were saying about the pretension and trying to make it more open. And um, you guys also talked about how hard COVID was and the um, challenges that businesses went through. Um, I don't think it's any secret that Minneapolis has been challenged from a diversity standpoint in our different neighborhoods and the people that live here. Um, and all the locations that you guys are in are pretty high scale. You kind of have a little bit of a luxury brand in some ways, um, in a lot of ways. Have you guys ever considered about how you're implementing like a diversity element of like 
food has a long heritage with every make and model of people. Um, so have you thought about addressing that and welcoming different neighborhoods into your experience? Are you selling us on some neighborhoods? Let's go. I have some food deserts. Yeah, yeah, good. No, there is, I mean, there is a lot, there is a lot of the food deserts, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> it's so interesting because we have been offered a lot of different places to just look at. And it's hard because when you look at a space, I mean, I'll just speak from the restaurant side of the world. Like when you look at a restaurant space and there's nothing else around you in that neighborhood, you have to ask why, why does nothing exist in that neighborhood? And you can be the first and hopefully more get drawn to it. I mean, when I opened Spoon, it was just Spoon and Bachelor Farmer and that was it. And then where they are now was a store called The Local Delish. I don't know if you remember that, but it was like a little market. I did all my interviews for the for Spoon there. And now I look at that street and it's growing more and more and more. And there's more restaurants going into it more. Um, there's a hotel, there's all sorts of things. So for us, we're open to going anywhere with it. You know, I think ultimately what it comes down to is what is the right space? Where does it feel right? And where's there a need? Again, a lot of it is just putting this map out and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not being really literal in that sense, but just sort of looking around and saying like, where is the need for that? And where can we put it? I mean, take Patisserie 46 and where they are. So don't go over there. They've got, it's, it's sort of, they have their spot. And as you look at spaces here in the Twin Cities, they all sort of match and meet a different part of the neighborhood, but growth and being diverse in where we want to go. I mean, that's really important. And as we grow, we'll see what that looks like. And then I would add to the, in terms of diversity in the class offering, I mean, our, my opinion is that the best place to engage people, uh, again, is through food. And we try to, um, Susie, who's floating around over here, she uh, manages all the schedule for the cooking classes that we offer. And we try to be as diverse as we possibly can. And we would like, if we're going to have an ethnic class, for example, or Mexican food, we'd love to have somebody who, they don't necessarily need to be from Mexico, but if they're Hispanic and they have a connection to the food, or if they're Italian and they know they make pasta at home, or they, you know, we really like for that to be a big part of it. And, you know, the, the challenge in offering that is we're in Minnesota, so it's really hard to find people that um, have an authentic ethnic connection to the food and feel comfortable teaching it and feel comfortable in front of a crowd or leading a team. So, um, but it's always front of mind because the more diverse we can be in the class offering, the more people get exposed to different ideas or different things, ethnic markets or all that kind of things. It's great. Wonderful. Another question. Thanks. Um, I've really enjoyed you talking about the joy and the creativity of building your brand. Um, I've historically owned a retail store. I wondered if you could just expand on you're building this beautiful thing, but um, it takes a lot of team members and operations to keep that train going. And that's what really can get you down, I think. So I wondered if you just had any, you know, any insights into building a strong team. Well, I think, um, well, three of our team members are here. They're sitting in the second row there. Raise your, raise your hand, wave, wave. Thank you, thank you. Kelly won't. Um, <laughs> And I, those guys are, uh, they've, Susie has been with us for 18 years. Um, so I think that one of the keys is you have longevity. Um, and how you get longevity is we are just super inclusive with our team. Uh, we believe in developing people. And um, even if you start, Susie started as a kindergarten teacher and she was working part-time on the retail floor 18 years ago. And we saw something in Susie and Susie saw something in us. And so we, we continue to grow and develop and grow and develop. And um, she's kind of like on, on the retail side, she is the third leg of our stool. So we really do believe in the people who come to work for us and we really will take extra measures to develop them. And yeah. I'm gonna jump in on that too. It's, uh, and we, Marie and I and Gavin have had a lot of conversations on this that um, and we've heard this from other people in our channel in other parts of the country that have small cooking stores like us. Um, nothing that happens at Cooks is 
circumstantial. Everything is deliberate. We have a leadership development program. We have, we've been working with an organizational development coach, Marie and I, um, we've been working with Patrick for 18 years. We have 18 years of one of our, one of our deals is we do an annual vision for cooks and we set the strategy for what, what we wish to accomplish next year. And these are things, 100% of them are above and beyond the day-to-day -day detail. It's the things that are going to get us somewhere else. And last year we had four, we had four full pages of goals that we wanted to achieve this year. And, and one of them was not open a new store in Edina. And we do that planning in August so that we're ready for um, January because historically in the retail world, you come screaming into December 31st and then January, you got to catch your breath for three weeks and all of a sudden it's February before you figure out what's going to happen next. So we do that in August and we have 18 of those in the base in our office, 18 of these mind maps. And um, in our last leadership meeting, we'd accomplished already we're like 80% of the goals that we had set for this year, the above and beyond goals. And again, Edina was not, wasn't even on the map of something we were gonna do in August of last year. So in addition to all of those, we're gonna build and open a new store. And our, we wouldn't be there. Like this morning, before we came over here, we had um, at the store, there were eight people unpacking. We had school team, we had retail team, we had our buyers there, we had Marie and I were there, I'm hanging lights in the ceiling and it's, it takes, uh, it totally takes, and we understand it and we support it and we push really hard on where are we bringing people, how are we getting there, how are we making people better, stronger, faster, more Superman uh, in the span of their time with us. You, <clears throat> another question? Long pause. Hey, um, Gavin, I was kind of interested in your example of um, Danielle opening up the space uh, with a Tiffany's theme. Um, it really took me to, um, there was a story not too long ago about restoration hardware. Restoration hardware is no longer a furniture store. It's a chain upscale dining restaurant that sells furniture on the side. Going in that direction, my question is, is food saving retail or is retail upscaling food? And can the two be separated anymore? Well, wow, that's a good question. If you ask me food saving retail, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm supposed to say that. Uh, it's a great question. I, I think it's, I think honestly, there's probably a little bit of saving both. You know, the food business is a really tough business. The restaurant world is a brutal world. And COVID, COVID exposed that in a way for our, for our profession that we never thought we'd probably see. Uh, one thing, like the restaurant world doesn't do anything that has to do with technology, right? It's just not our, we, we don't understand it. Um, yeah, it's like Aloha, like all the POS systems are very, I mean, now they're, 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 they're newer, um, but it's just hard to sort of embrace all of that. And COVID exposed that for a lot of people. And I think what it exposed more than anything is that if you are a restaurateur, if you're not diversifying your brands in a way to be exposed to as many different people, like I've come to the realization that I probably can't ever open up, you know, a, um, a bar that serves chicken wings and French fries. I mean, I'd love to, and I wish I could, but the way that I'm judged with my food tends to be a little bit different. I'm judged in a very different way. And I, I know that, and I get that. And so I've got to think about where do I put, where do we put food and where do we put it in with retail? And this just sort of ended up clicking and working, but it is interesting to see restoration hardware does it. Now Tiffany's doing it. I know a couple of other stores in New York that haven't announced it, that they're going to do it. And it just keeps kind of growing. Um, and it's also a great way for retail to bring us in. I mean, you talk about the staffing and like, how do you take care of people? I mean, when we brought our world in to their world, it, it was very different, right? Because, I mean, they would call me and be like, so wait a minute. Some, I mean, Susie's been there 18 years. they will be like, so a baker wants to leave. They've been here a year and a half. I'm like, wow, we got a year and a half out of them? That's amazing. Give them a gold star when they leave. That's a year and a half. You know, and they're like, that, that happens? I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, every spring, you know, we lose a huge percentage of our staff because they're like, I want to go outside. I want to go play outside. I'm like, so do I. Um, 
So we, we, we understand that. And I think what we've now learned because of combining the food and the retail is actually how similar they really are from a culture perspective, from a training perspective, um, from, of course, hospitality perspective, but then really just like the end goals. And I mean, we've said it a little bit up here, but the three of us have had a lot of really in-depth conversations about all of this and what we want what we want it to look like. And through those conversations, there's been a lot of hard realization too, right? And the way that I run Spoon, Sable, and Demi, it's not any different than how I run the Belcor version of Cook's Belcor, um, but, I'm, but I'm learning more actually as a result because it's a totally different part of the world that I don't necessarily understand. Um, and I love to be curious and learn as much as we can. And I think that some restaurateurs are going into these retail shops for that reason too. Anything to add? Because we. I'll add a couple things. So when you look at, as Gavin said, food service, the restaurant world, it it's brutal, and so is retail. You know, and so um, when we combine, we're offering kind of this full. We've said it before. It's immersive. It's an experience, and I think that that's what other retailers are looking for too. You have to offer a bit more to keep people entertained and engaged. And um, so that's part of the motivation. It's also just, we've learned so much about food service during doing this. Um, and, you know, a little bit of a secret uh, is that we've layered some retail analytics around every single croissant that we sell. I mean, we, we, we're running it like we're retailers. So we're we're selling that like we're selling a spatula. You know, we're, we're really breaking it down. Um, and so it's been really kind of fun to be able to, it's, kind of, it's a little complicated, but it's Yeah, that's been really totally fun. different than my world. Yeah, it's totally They just they'll spend, say, they'll spend, 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 She'll say this to me and she's like, well, we sold this much last week. I'm like, listen, just, I'm like, it's all good. It's humid outside. No, I'm like, just feel it. She's like, feel it. I'm feel like, it. yeah, you know. Feel it. This is how it feels. It's what I want. You know, got, I don't know. We got payroll. We got, we got payroll. It's food. You can tell she's in control. <laughs> it's okay. I accept. Sort of. Questions? <clears throat> oh, making it really hard on me. Right in the middle. No. Um, I know the uh, pandemic and especially the lockdown stage was a huge shock to any industry touching food. I'd be curious to hear how much um, consumers have return to pre-pandemic behaviors and attitudes towards food and how much behavior has changed with sourdough making and ordering takeout and, and where you see uh, consumer behavior going in the future. And that's for all three of you. It's changed so much. It's changed a lot. Um, it, it, it also, it, honestly, it varies a little bit on the city that you're in. So we'll talk Minneapolis. Uh, it's, it has, in terms of like cover count and people going out to eat, we see the same level now, what we saw before the pandemic. Um, people eat out earlier. They don't eat out as late anymore as they used to. Um, there was a time where everybody was really, they, were, they would go out to eat and they were very forgiving about things. We've gone the other end of the spectrum and they're less forgiving a lot faster now. Um, so, it's, so it's more pressure on the hospitality staff. Uh, and you've seen a lot of adjustments around that in restaurants. I know my restaurants, we do a hospitality charge and I know that that's super confusing for guests to understand and I get it. We can totally jump into it, but there's a lot of legality behind it, which why it makes it so hard to understand. But for our teams, um, they see the benefit. They see the benefit in that. Everybody, specifically in the dining room, actually more in the dining room, they see a benefit. So it's, it's changed a lot. I think also what I've, what I've noticed is that a lot of people stay in their neighborhoods, you know, so it's less venture, it's less venturing out. Um, and, and it's more about, it's a lot more about convenience sometimes than it is quality. And it's like, well, I can go to this restaurant down the street. It might not be as good, but it's closer to my house. And so I'm going to go versus I'm going to go out to eat and drive 25 minutes to go out to eat at this, at this other restaurant, but it'll ebb and flow. You know, um, we have, I've also seen more people cry in my restaurants in the last three years than I have ever seen before because they're like emotionally taken back by hospitality happening to them, realizing that they don't have to wash the drinks or the, co or the cocktail glasses or plates that they've just been served. 
Um, so we've seen a whole array of all of it. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a wild, it was a, certainly a wild experience to go through. That's for sure. It made us a much better company. I do know that. And for us, it was, uh, it, we, we kind of had to put the wheels, I say this all the time, we had to put the wheels back on the bus. It was, we were shut down for a period of time and um, team members, some team members moved on. We opened very slowly here. So that, that was, it was very, it was a strain on the business. We had supply chain issues. You guys all know that. Um, it took us kind of, we, we were still thinning out duplicate products. We had to bring in some sub, par products just to get by. Um, and, you know, things like hours. We, we changed our hours seven times, seven times. We hadn't changed our store hours for 35 years. You know, no, I'm sorry, 49 years. And in the, you know, two years ago, we changed them just to accommodate. We just didn't know how people were responding. On a positive note, we saw so much positive, energy coming into our stores all of 2022 because people were happy to be back on Main Street. They really wanted to support local. Um, and they, you know, people can say that, but they really put their money where their mouths were. I mean, they really came in and they wanted to hang out. They wanted to talk. Um, so it's been, it's been good. We're seeing um, things are kind of leveling off now. Uh, but the other thing is, is team. You know, there were a lot of team members who didn't want to work during that period of time. So um, now we're seeing more people coming back, wanting to be face to face with customers. And um, a lot of that fear has dissipated. So it's good. And then I would add that um, the fallout in small mom and pop retail around the country is cataclysmic in our channel, little small gourmet specialty retail stores. Um, before the pandemic, there were knocking on 900 of us in the United States. And at the last trade show, one of our vendors said there, the stat now is between 350 and 375. And I think that, uh, you know, St. Paul, we're on Grand Avenue, which is the main retail thoroughfare. And when all the dust settled, everybody kind of came out to Grand Avenue and they were like, holy smokes, there's nobody left. And every small town you drive through, it's like, Walmart is fine, but everybody on Main Street is gone. And, I, and the extent to which that trend sort of continues where people look at their version of Main Street, whether that's in Blaine or in St. Paul or in Victoria, wherever the small town is, it's like that landscape has now changed and I suspect irrevocably. It's not gonna, it's so difficult now to get, and our vendors, our vendors are out of business. I mean, some of the, hard the mainstay people that we that cooks had done business with for 50 years they're they're out of business because there is no market anymore and i think that idea of oh well, i'll just sit on my couch and buy a wustoff knife online people are now saying mm, i better pay attention because the only thing left on main street is a nail salon and three banks but another shift in our business is in our cooking classes we have uh, 2022, we hosted more people in cooking classes than we have in the entire history of our business of 50 years. Wow. So what we found was that people really wanted to be together. They wanted to learn something new. They had been cooking at home for themselves. Um, and we tried something during the pandemic. We did a lot of, uh, and Gavin, you did this too. Uh, we did cooking classes online so that people could access things at any point in time. Simple things like how to make a vinaigrette. So we put it online, you know, just really, really simple things. Um, Maybe they weren't so good at home like they thought, you know, they needed us to, to teach them, right. you know? Yeah. I mean, that's why they kept coming out. Mm -hmm. And now they're back and they're bringing all their friends um, and our cooking classes are, they're, they're packed. We have some of our classes, we have, there was one class, we had an 80 person wait list. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty good. So people want to be together, they want to learn. I love that. That is a great conclusion because we're all here together, hanging out, shaking hands, having conversations. I also want to go a little bit back to the first time Carl and I met. We were introduced and we started having conversations. And I think we had three or four conversations and finally I said, you know what? I should probably pay you for these conversations. And you're going to pay me? That's <laughs> a funny man. 
and so, and the, but working with you has been amazing. It's been a wonderful, joyful experience. And the team has loved it. Um, and Gavin, meeting you a long time ago, I was amazed by, you broke the internet when you came here. And, and, and there's a lot of ego in your industry, right? There's a lot of pretension. There's a lot of, yeah. And you didn't exhibit that at all. It was just, you were like, I mean, to go back to hospitality, you were a human. You were like someone you could hang out with. You brought a spoon to our table, right? That was, there were little moments and you continue to be that way, even though all the stuff you've done. So I commend that. It's impressive. So um, that's our show, unless there's one more question, really short one. No, good. Because we're at the end of our hour. I know, I know. Uh, so this is something, again, like I said, we put on once a month, typically the third Thursday. There's a QR code back there in the corner and up at the front thing. All we ask is a nice little review of our team and what they've done. Because uh, Rachel over there is going to get like ping, 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 a bunch of reviews as you leave the door. You're like, this is freaking amazing. All five stars, though, right? Five stars. Um, we have James Damien next month, uh, June 20th. Right, that's uh, be a leave a Thursday in June. James Damien with Paco Underhill. If you don't know Paco Underhill, and you're probably not in retail, um, you should know Paco Underhill. Best known for the butt brush. You'll have to look that up. I'm not gonna share what it is. It's a little awkward. Yeah, um, it, they'll be an amazing pairing. So Paco Underhill and James Damien next month. Thank you. I haven't talked about Paco Underhill at all with you guys. No, I probably should have, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> We missed one thing. We'll get that next. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.